Hi, it's Jim here from Our Circle. I am joined this afternoon by uh, Emma Vogel. Uh, Emma, how are you? I'm really good. All the better for seeing you, Jim. Thank you very much, Emma. That's excellent. <laughs> Emma, look, I really want to start to chat about what you've been doing, what you're up to, the great work you're doing with Radical Recruiters. Um, but, but just to kick off, let, let, let's just be a little bit lighthearted. First and last, what's the first drink you reach for in the morning when you get up? Um, I'm currently a mocha, a homemade mocha. mocha. Yeah. Oh, yeah. nice. Lately, it's it's winter drinking, isn't it? Oh, completely. What's the last drink you go to? Um, probably the same thing, if I'm honest. Really, you mocha of the night and in the morning. Yeah, Fantastic. well, it's either that or wine. And um, <laughs> mm -hmm. school nights, I'm 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 off the wine on school nights. <laughs> Definitely. And when this lockdown's over and we can get out and about, who's the first person you'd like to see? Oh, good question. I have a friend who's been stuck in Bali. Bali? Bali, I think. Um, sunning himself for the last 12 months. Um, so he'll be due back as soon as lockdown ends and flights come come back into the country. So my, my friend Hamid. Um, oh. who I, my first ever man friend, my first ever English man friend, and he's like my big brother, so I can't wait to see him. Fantastic. Who's the last person you'd like to see when lockdown's out? Oh, my year 10 French teacher. She was an awful cow. <laughs> Brilliant. Fantastic. Emma, look, um, I understand the work you've been doing. Um, I'd like you just to tell us a little bit more of how you're finding things, what you've been up to. But let's roll back to, to October 2019. And, and that's when you started. And, and, and give us a bit of a journey of the things you've been up to from then to now. Gosh, I've done loads. I think um, I, I try and make an effort of like stopping and reflecting and taking stock. And whenever I do, I think actually I've done a lot more than I, I realise. But um, I started what was meant to be a very small pilot project, a recruitment project for people who experience barriers to work like criminal convictions or homelessness or having had contact with the care system. And um, my intention was to place 10 people from these different constituencies that I was really interested and passionate about into work, um, having supported them to get ready for work and then um, secure, uh, su support them to sustain their employment over sort of a period of six months and then take that data to a funder and say, this model works, we've proven the concept, give us money, scale up. Um, but my plans went out the window shortly after I launched and um, I think, you know, the general election and the Brexit vote and Christmas and now the apocalypse. Um, and what was meant to be a small project has turned into something much bigger. So fast forward, I think we're in, we're in almost in our 14th month, 13th month, um, and we've placed 75 people from lots of different um, backgrounds into jobs that they love. And uh, we've sustained 90% of them at up to the six point mark so far, despite the pandemic. So um, it's been a really, it's been a big year. It's been a year of like learning, loads of learning and, and um, trying and failing and iterating and trying again. Uh, yeah. but Definitely. And, and, and Emma, tell us the backgrounds of the people that you're helping and supporting. Give us a little insight and everyone insight to, to the types of people that you, you're working with. Yeah, so I mean, uh, the, the the person who inspired the project um, is a, a woman called Chanel. So in my previous role, I was the chief operating officer for a recruitment charity called Work and Chance. And um, they supported women who were coming out of the prison system um, into jobs that they, they liked or loved and uh, to become better sort of citizens, whatever that looks like, and also to reintegrate into society and, and their family and things like that. And Chanel, Chanel was someone that I met like maybe 18 months before. And I was tasked with writing her a CV. Um, I had 20 minutes on the phone to her two weeks before she was released from prison. You get about 20 minutes on the phone before you get cut off on prison calls. And um, so I, I learned as much about Chanel as I could at that point, um, which was that she was, she was an, a care leaver. She was an ex-offender. She had 16 siblings, young black woman, born into generational poverty. Um, you know, and a, and a life of crime, essentially. And she'd been taken into care um, when she was quite young. And then um, as soon as she was old enough, she ended up in an um, adult prison 
a women's prison in 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 Surrey called Downview, and um, and and then when I met her, she was sort of preparing for release. So she is the type of person that she she inspired radical, but she's also one of the types of people that we we work with. People sort of born into really tumultuous circumstances that are well beyond their control, um, and people who really don't have a great deal of opportunity in their early years or in their sort of as they grow into adults. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, we, we support people who have had careers potentially, have really refined sets of skills um, and have, you know, career gaps for, for lots of different reasons. It might be that they've suffered with drug and alcohol addiction. It could be that they've um, had a bereavement in their family um, and not been able to actually go to work for a period of time and lost their home and ended up on the streets. Uh, we work with people who are um, survivors of domestic violence. So the people we work with are, are largely underrepresented in the labour market. Um, the majority of our candidates are BIPOC. Um, they may be returned veterans. They could be um, victims of modern slavery. They could be refugees with asylum and work uh, right to work status. We, we really anyone that sort of has a barrier to work that makes it very difficult for them to get on on the corporate ladder or I mean the life ladder really we work with. I mean that's it's, it's amazing and as I say that I've got a bit of insight to, to what you're doing. The, the challenges you face um, having been in recruitment a long time myself re recruitment itself is, is, is a challenge but how is that challenge you're facing going to employees what, what's the sort of appetite what are the hurdles you're finding and, and, and how can we help? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's sort of two types of employers. There are ones that understand that being radical is good for business, but don't quite know where to start. And there are, and, but, but desperately want to do something. And then there are others who um, being radical is more of a tick box exercise. So, I mean, the 90% the of the hard work we do is actually about dismantling employer perceptions um, of the people that we work with. So often our people, particularly people who come from prison, um, care or homeless backgrounds are sort of viewed through this lens of mistrust and they're assumed or perceived to be sort of antisocial, um, lacking the motivation required to, to get a job or the skills that employers want, which is largely untrue. So I mean, I used to, when I was young and green, try and change people's minds about the people that we work to. But what I've learned actually is that the best way to um, sort of facilitate change in with our corporate partners is actually to, to add to their perceptions. We do that by proving that our radicals do make valued and contributing members of teams, but also more broadly society. So I think, you know, the, the key thing is about sort of getting people to think beyond what they think they know and, and challenge the status quo in that way. Um, but our candidates tend to speak for themselves because unlike other sort of third sector providers that have a focus on employment, we are not asking for employers to give our people jobs um, out of charity. Our candidates um, get a huge amount of support from the team at Radical to ensure that they are equipped with the, the confidence, the skills and the tools they need to um, compete in open recruitment processes. So when a, when a radical gets offered a um, interview, they, they get that interview um, invitation on the merit of their application and they've applied like every other candidate to that employer's role. If they get offered the job, it's because they're the best candidate at the end of the recruitment process. They get vetted in exactly the same way as every other new starter within the business. The key difference is that we support people um, to see their potential and employers to see our radicals potential and give them what they need to um, navigate through those your, your usual recruitment process and then uh, when when we've placed a person or a radical we stay with them because I mean I think everyone everyone has hurdles that that life throws in their way that has a potential to sort of stop them from bringing their full self to work and performing at their best. So what we do at Radical is we touch base with our, our newly placed um, candidates once a week for the first three months and ask questions like, how's work and how's life? 
Um, and generally through those conversations, we can gauge whether the person's happy in their job, whether we've sold them a dream, whether their manager is a good manager, whether onboarding is happening in the right way, whether um, you know, they have the, the, the confidence to ask questions. You know, they, sometimes it's about directing them to the staff handbook to say, you need to read that policy because actually the manager's right. You shouldn't have text in sick, you should have called. So things that trip people up, um, in the first three months, we, we really um, look to provide interventions for support with so that those things aren't, don't become issues that can't be managed or, or solved. And on the flip side, I think most of the work that we do actually post-placement is around supporting um, employers to onboard, support and develop um, their, their teams, our radicals, because, I mean, HR practice is good HR practices that I find incredibly rare. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and you often have people in people management roles that aren't probably qualified to do their jobs or aren't interested in people management or aren't being supported themselves. So, you know, things like um, managing people issues retrospectively come up all the time. You know, I'll have a call with a, a radical and they say, oh, my manager said, that this person said this about me a month ago, but they didn't tell me and, I'm, and I, you know, they should have because yeah. feedback and, and, um, and performance management should be happening as and when the issues arise. So these are the types of conversations that we have with our radicals that I can sort of flag with the HR lead to say, hey, I think this is going on and I'm really concerned it's gonna turn into something bigger than it needs to be. Can you get involved? And the HR will say, yep, I'm on it. And they'll come in through the side door and support the people manager to do a better job, essentially. So there's lots of um, lots of work that we do, not only with our radicals, but with our employers to make sure that they're ready to hire from untapped talent um, and that they're supporting and developing our people. Because ultimately what we want our radicals to be able to do is um, move into bigger, better jobs. Yeah, because everyone, yeah. everyone wants, isn't it, to sort of mm -hmm. grow and develop. And ideally, if they can do that in the same business that they started in, that's great for employers too. Definitely, and I think you, you, the work that you're doing is, is goes beyond what the the, the, the you know radical radical recruitment. You know, it, it's it's more than that, isn't it? You you are a partner. You're influencing firms to understand the benefits. Of, of hiring some of the people that you're supporting, but you're also challenging the status quo. You're, you're moving the dial in many respects. I mean, that must be an enormous challenge because you're so busy, uh, you know, even growing, grabbing time today, you, you, we know that our diaries are all over the place. You know, where, where, are, we, where are you heading? Where's, where's Radicals heading and, and what support from people outside? Because I know you were talking about crowdfunding, there's a CSR program, there's lots going on. Tell us a little bit more about that and what you're doing and how we can help on that front. Yeah, so we're, we're looking, we've done a big piece of work around um, getting people who were rough sleeping at the start of the pandemic um, off the streets and into, into jobs that will enable them to leave their homelessness behind. And I think what we've realized is not only have we proven that it's possible to do that, um, it's actually, uh, the, the, the need to be doing more of that work is, is um, growing day by day. The, the pandemic and, and the lockdown have disproportionately affected people who experience homelessness and other barriers to work. I mean, if you look at like, there's been, a, I think, over an 80% rise in rough sleeping amongst um, the 18 to 25 population. So wow. um, homelessness has gone from 230, I think, to over 300K since lockdown, so an increase of over 100,000 100, people with 100,000 people more estimated to lose their homes despite the um, eviction ban. And 11% of those individuals are, are young people. So I think um, the, the future of Radical is very much focused on supporting people to get through this pan pandemic um, in one piece and um, you know the solution to lots of people's homelessness is is employment so our focus will be on supporting more people who are um, currently in unstable accommodation whether that's rough sleeping or sofa surfing or staying in a hostel um, to to find jobs that they love and become financially autonomous 
And I guess um, we're doing that in, in partnership with some amazing businesses. So recently we've partnered with Mighty, we're working with Compass, um, Cook, Marston Holdings, all of these organisations have um, volume recruitment needs in lots of different areas of their business and they can see the potential of our, our radicals and um, have sort of come on board with this project and we're looking to sort of really consolidate what we've started and, and expand our reach together. So we'll be piloting in Manchester shortly um, and we're looking to do more in, more in London, but there's, I mean, homelessness is everywhere. So that's, I think 2021 mm -hmm. will be a focus on, on people who are at risk of or currently homeless. And most people who are homeless also have sort of intersecting disadvantage. So it fits in with our, our the work of and focus of, of radical more broadly in the sense that, you know, most 80, 80 odd percent of people that come out of prison are released homeless. Um, I would say the majority of those people have suffered either mental health um, or addiction mm -hmm. or domestic violence or, you know, any number of the other sort of um, issues that we, we hope to address uh, through our work at Radical. So that, that's sort of the grand plan. And we're doing that in partnership with the, the corporate world and, and um, well, small, any business really, um, who has hiring needs or has CSR and DNI commitments to make and meet. Um, so we're about to launch a, a crowdfunder, which is like incredibly exciting, but equal parts terrifying um, in, a, in an attempt to extend um, our work into 2021 with, with this homeless constituency that is continually growing um, and with a view to retaining my existing team who I recruited mm -hmm. and mobilised in three weeks but happened to be just the best group of humans who do huge volumes of the best quality work and are literally changing lives every day. So that's, that's the plan. It, I mean, it sounds an amazing plan. And, and, you know, how are you, you dealing with this? Be, because that's the business, you're the business, but, 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 but yourself, you know, the business has challenges. What challenges are you facing, you know, apart from not having much time in the day and I'm, I'm conscious of our time now? Yeah, I mean, I think um, with, the, with the current sort of austere economic environment, there isn't a lot of money. Um, so I have taken a huge amount of um, responsibility and I feel very pers personally responsible for the people that we're working with. So we have over 500 radicals registered on our books and we've, we're, we've um, supported 75 into work and we, we still have contact with those individuals to make sure that they sustain their employment and they get advocacy and support as and, as and when required. So we've got sort of 600 people roughly that I am feel responsible for. So when when our, our funding runs out on the 16th of December and I've got a I've got sort of enough to keep two minute noodles in my pantry until March 2021. Mm -hmm. But essentially um, the pressure of of finding money to keep doing the work that we do um, in in the current climate is is quite stressful. But that aside, I I feel incredibly um, privileged and honored to be able to do this work. I think it's um not, not everyone gets to go to work and in, enjoy what they do. Um, and as someone who, like I, when I was growing up, I mean, we didn't have loads of money, but my parents, I always had food on the table, nutrition, nutritional, nutritious, good food. You know, I was never hungry. I always had clean clothes on my back. I, you know, I went to school. That was my, my only um, responsibility as a child I wasn't even allowed to work gym when I was of working age because my parents insisted that I get an education so that I would have opportunities in my future and I I buggered around during school as well I didn't even I didn't even know what that meant back then you know and when I when I really disappointed my parents I still knew that they loved me and I had a loving home so you know there's so many people that can't say that and it, it, for me, th that's what this work is about, isn't it? It's about, yeah. you know, creating communities where people get opportunities. So yeah, you, that, you're I'm changing gonna... people's lives. Yeah, you, 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 you can see that. Yeah, and and you know, we want to support the mission, and and hopefully the listeners will be doing that as well. Um, I'm already conscious of your time. Yeah, no worries. You're going to be joining us again on the 25th. 
Um, we'll be telling you a little bit more about the R Circle event on the 25th. You'll be able to hear from Emma and her articles and some of the success that she's doing, the amazing work she's been doing as well. Emma, thank you so much for chatting over the lunch period. Um, I know you're flat out and we know we have to, to, to go. We could have carried on chatting a lot more, but I look, appreciate you your time. You. <laughs> oh, I, I, loved, I love talking to you and thank you very much for having me. No problem. Thank you, Emma. Yeah. Chat very soon. Bye.